Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new edition of Low Code Cafe, the first edition for 2021. We had 25, 25 editions uh, last year. It's a lot of uh, effort that uh, we put in, but also a lot of good feedback that we got from our community to keep coming with new things every week. So when you think about it, 25 uh, hours of webinar recording is it's quite a lot and it's a big achievement. So uh, with this, I want to also thank everyone that's been here uh, nearly every week. So I know it's a big time commitment for you as well. And also a lot of thanks for our team for making this possible, uh, putting the effort to prepare this uh, content. And uh, I know that sometimes, especially those of you that have been here uh, quite often, sometimes things don't work the way they should. But you know, that's the real local developer experience and figuring it out, it's also part of what we show in this webinar. So just uh, wanted to say that, yeah, we plan for it. <laughs> cool, so uh, good to see you again. Um, for those of you that are new to this webinar, you should know that this is a weekly event where we bring together the community, uh, but also our team, uh, uh, part, of, uh, part of our team. Uh, and it's a technical uh, webinar usually, so we discuss uh, um, about the product, what's coming. Sometimes we demo some features and um, also we have a hands-on part where we do actual code development. And um, yeah, and yeah, it happens every week. Um, basically, all these uh, webinars are recorded, so you can go back um, to uh, any, every, any episodes. They are published on our YouTube channel. We post the link in the chat uh, uh, in a bit. And uh, one thing you should know is that we added chapters to all videos. So even though they are one hour long videos, you can actually uh, uh, browse chapters so you can only jump to the parts that you are interested in. Um, usually we have the same, uh, the same agenda for uh, every, every uh, webinar. Uh, I will start to give you some update with what's been happening, a lot of interesting stuff, especially now that uh, we are starting uh, a new year. There's a lot to look back uh, back to. Uh, after that, we'll have uh, Reza, our head of product, give us a product update, what's coming, what's uh, hot, uh, what's uh, about to release. And then we'll have a hands-on uh, uh, part where Dale, uh, our head of support, will give us some uh, insights from what's happening, what's hot on our support channel, interesting cases and how we resolved it. And then we move towards the hands-on development, which is the largest chunk where today we'll be building some uh, custom UI templates using search, uh, search. So that's not very intuitive that you'd use a search engine to build custom UI, but you'll see uh, and you'll be impressed on with what you can achieve using this technique. Uh, great. So uh, just to give you a, uh, a brief uh, overview of uh, uh, maybe I should start off what happened last year uh, with us. So last year we started uh, more actively pu pushing on this new business that we started, Plant an App, right? We managed to release it publicly. Uh, it was November, around November, December 2019. So last year was a lot about consolidating and pushing in this direction. And we did really well, and uh, there's actually an update, a video update that you can watch on this uh, Republic campaign page. We did really well because last year we grew that business from nearly zero traction to half a million. You know, so it was a very good uh, business for Plant and M. And we want to continue this trend. We want to grow it at least four times this year. So you'll see a lot of plants, a lot of moving pieces that come together. Uh, and uh, again, it's something that I'm very grateful that we get to do together, both as a community and as a team. So also last year, uh, part of us moving so quickly is, is uh, fundraising from investors. So then we can uh, uh, move much quicker than we would be able just uh, financing ourselves through revenue from customers. So last year we launched this campaign on Republic, uh, which basically means it's an equity crowdfunding campaign, which basically means that anyone can become an investor in Plant on App. And uh, again, I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate it a lot that we have a lot of our customers, of our partners already invested in uh, in Plant on App. So 
uh, they are part of our uh, of our success uh, in multiple uh, in multiple ways. Uh, what we did this year, we also launched on Seedblink. Seedblink is a similar platform, but it's for Romania investors. Uh, we, uh, as you know, our home uh, where we started is Romania. That's where most of the technical team is, uh, even if uh, our headquarters is now in the US. But we have a good network of investors in Romania and they wanted to invest in Plantanet, but it was difficult through, through Republic. So then we launched this on a Romanian platform as well. And although we only launched it yesterday, we already raised around $100,000, you know, in one day. So that's very good science and that speaks of the good network that we have here. <clears throat> so uh, overall, our funding goal is around 2 million. Uh, so that's uh, that's what I'm uh, what we are pushing on, and it will be this uh, republic, it will be this seedling, and also it will be uh, VC traditional venture capital uh, firms that we are targeting. So uh, <clears throat> that's another invitation for those of you that haven't invested already. You still have the opportunities. The campaign is open until end of February, so you still have the opportunity to become an investor in Plant and App, uh, and. Uh, uh, in the future, basically, of DNN and DNN Sharp. Last year, uh, I announced that we participated in a competition on 17th of December uh, at uh, the European Bank of Reconstruction Development. And I'm proud to announce that we won that competition. So that comes with uh, $100,000 in uh, cash rewards and also mentoring interest to customers, to investors. So it's a very good program. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, and they run it at uh, at uh, the European level, but also internationally. They also have good ties with the US and everything. Uh, the competition was about uh, innovation uh, regarding uh, responses to the coronavirus, and uh, I wanted to share with you. And this is something also that I've been starting doing in this webinar quite often, showing use cases. So I want to show you the use case that uh, helped us win that the competition. So this is a um, an uh, university from Glasgow, uh, University of Strathclyde, and they've been using DNSR for years, and they move uh, they are moving to Plant and uh, they use they use our technology to build all kinds of systems. But this one in particular, they needed to build really fast because uh, the government decided that every student that changes households during holidays should be tested, right? So they, they only had a few days to deliver a system uh, live that uh, handles, uh, <clears throat> handles appointments. So students can schedule uh, uh, two appointments, three to five days apart, but also then have various loads with uh, different loads. So you don't have overcrowd, you don't overcrowd the test centers, right? Then reporting and a lot of, uh, a lot of other features. Uh, so here you can see some screenshots, like on the right is the scheduling piece, and then on the left is the uh, reporting piece. So they were able to do this system and go live, live with it in two days, right? So that's, that's a very big thing for software development in general, but also when you think about, uh, about, about this uh, COVID, uh, uh, how do you say, the COVID uh, situation that requires fast response. Right. And they also helped us to understand the benefits for them because uh, they also have IT uh, teams, development teams, you know, and they have other local tools in their organization. So the, the estimate that they did is that it would have taken 12 weeks if they went through traditional development route or four weeks if they choose a different local platforms, you know, because <clears throat> the big difference in, in Plant and App <clears throat> is it allows uh, plugging code directly into the platform at runtime. Whereas most of the other low code platforms requires you to go to the traditional development process, you know, to have two weeks iterations, uh, feedback loops in between, plan the next iteration and so on. So every single line of custom code that you want to deploy changes into a one week or two week uh, sprint. <clears throat> Cool. So yeah, they and they estimated that they saved 95% uh, of the costs that it, it would have taken with custom development when they calculated like the total cost of ownership. Yeah, so this, uh, this, uh, this uh, was the very good story that won us that award. So 
this, uh, these uh, are the updates from uh, my end. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer any. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, I would like to invite uh, Reza Gero, our head of product, to, to take over and give us some updates of uh, the releases that we are working on, what's coming, what's next. Thanks, Bogdan. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, let me get my screen shared here. Okay, so yeah, we had a, a very great year last year, especially from the product standpoint. And in Q4, really started getting us positioned for um, this year and some of the next level features. So it was a lot of stability and kind of having a coherent experience with the product is what we worked on a lot last year and, and kind of having all the moving pieces work together well and, you know, not do no harm was, was kind of the motto and the thing we were after and making sure that updates and overrides of entities and things like that uh, wasn't going to do any damage to uh, what you had built so far. And I think we've, we've done a really good job of that and, and now we're positioned for kind of what comes next. Um, uh, we do have release 111, which we um, finished up right at the end of the year. And with the holidays and things, I just, uh, we had people out. I didn't feel comfortable um, releasing. Uh, did have several people um, as part of our beta tester, client tester program. That helped a lot. And we found a, a couple of minor issues. Uh, we've cleaned those up in the last week and um, release is imminent. I believe um, we're packaging things up right now. And I anticipate that tomorrow, um, the release will officially be out and you should be able to see that within the application and update right from within the application. Ton of stuff went into this last release. It is like everyone before the best version of plant and app yet. Highly encourage you to adopt it. Uh, keep yourselves current, not just for goodies and features, but there's a lot of security and stability and, and um, abilities to uh, receive updates and things like that better. And uh, so I always recommend never letting yourself drift too far behind uh, and have to play catch up. With that, some of the key things that I'll touch on, uh, we have the new page builder skin. I feel like that's ready for prime time uh, yeah. beyond just being a good skin. Uh, it has the page builder functionality in it. And with that, you're able to really work with the uh, app builder side of the house, which lets you build your back end right from within the front end. So if you need to create a workflow, edit an entity, add a field, uh, configure your modules, anything like that, you can do that right from there. Push a button, the screen will refresh, your changes are there. Um, I've been using it on a couple of sites and it's uh, working really, really well and, and it's just a good looking skin. It also is, uh, doesn't have the vertical menu, which you can lay in using the uh, navigation menu module if you did want to have some sort of uh, sub menu. You also have the ability to set and define your default skin. That was a late addition to the application so that uh, once you adopt page builder, for example, any new pages or entities you create will have that. It will as well go and retroactively apply it to pages that you've already created or uh, in your application. Uh, we introduced the ability to clone uh, workflows. So not just import and export uh, individual actions within the workflow, but now uh, clone the workflows. When we get into 112 and beyond here in a second, I'll talk about why that's important and where we're going. Um, we've, I believe we've finished up uh, the export to GitHub. So pretty much everything uh, that is material within your applications, the workflows, the tokens, the pages, your settings, entities, all of these things are being exported out to GitHub, which again positions us for being able to uh, export and import applications, restore versions and things. And this is some of the stuff that we're going to be working on here in Q1. And so first step was to make sure everything was getting out there into GitHub. If you don't have the GitHub integration on your applications, I highly recommend using it. It's been a lifesaver even with what's there uh, now several times. Sometimes you goof up, you wish you could go back to what things look like two or three saves ago. Um, and most of these things that are exported out there, you can just copy and paste via the import features built into the various uh, areas of the application. So whether it's workflows, actions, tokens, these sort of things, you can just uh, copy paste uh, popping up the import uh, uh, functionality that's built into much of the application and, and get yourself right again. Um, also did a little bit of uh, uh, work on the automation, also known as the scheduler. Uh, there was some issues uh, and performance issues 
um, stability issues where the scheduler wasn't always uh, running, especially if your app had spun down and things. So a lot of work uh, went into that. It also is faster. And uh, one thing of note is in the entity builder now, when you go to create a new entity, by default, this will be turned off, but you have the option to say, do I want to index or not into the automation and the search? So there's some things you don't want to reveal in search. One, maybe it's just not useful, and, and so why eat up the cycles to index that stuff? But two, some things really maybe for security reasons, other things are not appropriate to have people be able to type into the search bar on the top of the screen and see the results of. So you can uh, turn those off retroactively, but anything new by default now will not be getting indexed. So that, that will, again, help with performance and the size of the index that's getting built up in the back end, things like that, not eating up your database space. Uh, we cleared uh, DNN 9.8 testing completely, including uh, ensuring that we have no dependencies on Telerik, which DNN will be removing at some point. Uh, we don't use it at all. I know it has some security issues and things like that. We haven't used it in a while, uh, but we've just confirmed that everything's good there. So if you've been wanting to go to DNN 9.8, uh, I recommend it. It's all our stuff's uh, running on it, anything new we do, and it's been running just fine. Uh, this doesn't do justice to this release. There are a ton of, of little bug fixes, security things, stability stuff, things we've been hearing from you all. So again, highly recommend it. Um, 40, 50 changes have gone into this release. Looking ahead, and I think next week, uh, I'd like to start sharing uh, the roadmap, not just at the current and next release level, but uh, having us have um, our muscles and legs under us for being able to always have a kind of a three month uh, looking out view uh, with some level of confidence. And, and so you all know where we're going. Uh, I wanted to give a preview of that today, though. Uh, in release 112, which we're finishing up planning and design of, uh, one of the key themes or focus areas is going to be workflows. Uh, and that, that was kind of what I mentioned a second ago there in this release, where you have that ability to clone them. That set the stage for being able to import and export them. Um, and, and just a bunch of other um, little UI enhancements that make workflows uh, better to work with. They are such a important and powerful feature to plant an app and, and running your business logic and things like that. So um, things like being able to save and test from within the workflow builder itself. So the BPMN interface, so no need to save, close out, you know, test, see that you have an issue close out a bunch of screens, edit, and go make a change and rinse and repeat, you'll be able to just hit save and test and uh, test it right from within there. If you want to make a change, you get the, the test interface out of the way and just keep working right there. Um, also being able to set uh, certain inputs as required, maybe default the values in them. We had talked about grouping the workflows as you start getting used to working with these and see the power of them. You'll be making a lot of workflows and that, that list can get a little bit unruly and big, especially if you don't have uh, some good naming conventions in, in, in play. Uh, to organize them better. So we'll start grouping those and you'll be able to define these groups and things. Uh, taking this all the way uh, up to being able to save the inputs when you're testing the workflows. Uh, it, one, just to make it more convenient to retest, but a very powerful thing will be that you will be able to schedule and automate the testing of the workflows then. So you'll have known tests of, hey, when I input these values into this workflow, this is what outputs should come out of it. And you'll be able to run those so that you'll know that after an update or after you make changes to a different workflow or a certain area of your application, everything still runs. So kind of getting into that test automation uh, ability within your applications. Uh, Entity Builder, a uh, very requested feature uh, we'll be taking up is being able to connect to other SQL, starting with SQL Server tables uh, in your databases, um, and then getting the benefits of App Builder around that. So your UI creation and, and um, some of the actions for reads and different things like that. Um, it, we're going to be taking that up here in this quarter, also being able to organize the entities under these same groups. So these groups can kind of um, start if you think about them serving as almost um, logical groupings or little app spaces within your app. 
so that you can have um, you know, more of a portal that, that can do many things. Maybe one part of it's ticketing, one part of it is marketing automation. You've been seeing a lot of the things we build in here. Uh, right now it ends up being a little free for all if you put in um, you know, more than one domain worth of concern within the system. Unless you use your own good naming, uh, things don't group up well. So you, you know, wanting to let the workflows and the entities as well be able to be grouped. Uh, kind of similar to what you're seeing inside the API builder. Uh, and so I mentioned that we've got pretty much everything going out to GitHub now. Now we're going to start making use of that and being able to uh, import in out of GitHub, restore in, deploy to test environments, things like that, and making that uh, very easy to do, leveraging that GitHub integration. Um, we did fail to mention that in 111, we have the uh, proof of concept for the new calendar template. Uh, encourage you to check that out. It's pretty slick. Uh, we'll be doing some polish and refinement on that. It is usable and, and useful as is now, uh, but there's more to do there. And so we're going to keep doing that. Um, also got a new token coming. Uh, this was kind of a requested feature that we've had coming in for a while now. So you can create database tokens currently against a SQL database and then use those tokens very easily in your front end or to loop over them in Razor scripts and stuff, wanting to use that read entity action that we have and automatically when you create an entity, uh, create such a token for you. So you have that available again to use on the front end and, and be able to just plop these tokens in wherever and you'll pick that up automatically. Um, we've talked in the past episodes about improving the developer experience around being able to debug and log things. So right now the administrator logs, usually error related, uh, are being um, pulled into App Builder's backend under the log section, but a lot of things are logged to disk by App Builder itself. And so we want to bring that in and, and, and expose that to you. But there is that uh, log debug um, info action and it doesn't get a lot of use and I think part of it is because you would have to go to disk find those logs and open them up and look in there so wanting to pull those in automatically as well and now you'll be able to have some really good logging and breadcrumbs and clues you can leave behind for yourself as you're building so as always there's uh, some there's a security roadmap and some things that you know we want to upgrade and make sure that all of our dependencies and different things are always patched and current uh, so that there are no, uh, no vulnerabilities and things just sitting out there. And uh, well, we'll be taking those up as well this quarter. So anticipating uh, a release candidate at the end of January, uh, we'll probably release uh, 112 at the beginning of February. I'll have a, a more firmed up version of what's going to be happening in 112 next week, as well as a, a better look at what Q1 looks like, a little more visual than what we're seeing here. So that's hey, it. Reza, there's, uh, everyone's excited about the new roadmap and there's uh, several questions in the chat and in the question and answer. Didn't know okay. if you wanted to take a sure. look at those. So I see, will it be possible to clone records uh, to duplicate the record or just change the language field? Um, we should talk, Tycho, about that a little more. Uh, what you have in mind, um, there's some tricks you could do now um, that, that would make that somewhat easy enough to do uh, using some of the existing actions and functionality, but uh, be happy to hear more if you're looking for a, a, an action there or, or whatnot. I definitely could see some uh, usefulness in being able to do that, especially in batches um, where you maybe have, uh, you know, in, our, in, in my case, we have uh, releases, every release, and there's things that I have to recreate release to release by hand. And it would, I, did wire up something myself so I can pick a batch of items out of a grid and clone them, but we'd be happy to hear more about what you're looking for there. And then I see another one. What is the role of, ah, I forgot to mention that, the good old unauthenticated user. Yes, absolutely taking that up with Fervor. Uh, what we're talking about here is right now in your permissions and settings, uh, you have the roles that are identified inside of the application. And when you give permission to read or update or delete records, uh, the system automatically honors those, not just in forms and the listings about who can see what, but really you can override that stuff, right? But what you can't override because it's being set in, and um, processed down in the data layer and at the database level, which is not exposed to citizen developers, uh, that, that you know, basically it comes down to people who are not signed into the system can't work with any of the data unless you put in a load user action and load kind of a dummy user up 
uh, that would have permission. So absolutely, there is an unauthenticated user role that comes with DNN and wanting to expose that into App Builder so that you can have non-signed in users uh, uh, interact with the system. Probably this will come in two parts. The first one is just being able to read the data. Uh, right now, the created by ID is a required field in the system. So we need to think about how to handle it when there is no user ID. What do we put in there? Uh, so we'll probably take this in two chops, but the first one will at least be being able to expose the data out without having to write your own SQL or inject or load in a false user into the system. So Great, and there's one last one on the question and answer, which is about date time fields and entities. Um, So um, Hans, uh, need to. I, I'm. I feel your pain. Uh, what what we've got here is with date time. Uh, we made some changes in App Builder to properly handle date time. And uh, you know when you're in have people in different time zones. You know even though it, it felt like maybe in DNN Sharpland date time always worked really well, you weren't getting a real accurate read uh, of date time. And what we've done in App Builder is uh, leverage ISO date times, the, the standards, and uh, now have the ability when used correctly to project times in the user's time zone or the server's time zone. Uh, you can do a lot more with it. And, and we're handling it correctly in the back end, but it's become um, not user friendly and easy, honestly, to work with uh, on the front end and, and needing to kind of wrap your head around and use some alternate tokens. If there's, uh, I know that once you start doing it and get the feel for it, um, it, it becomes much uh, better to work with when you have it solved somewhere and you can just go references it in an example. If I, I know that there's been issues and bugs with that, uh, we'll take those up right away. Um, if this is one that you're having a specific issue on that, that it truly is uh, a bug in there, we'll, we'll take it up in this release and, and get it out right away as a hot fix or something. We've been, um, working several releases on, on trying to make that friendly and good and document it better and make it easier to work with. So if you wanna post something, uh, open a ticket or in the community uh, portal or just reach out to me, uh, I'll, we'll recreate the scenario and uh, if I can reproduce it, I'll have the guys take care of it right away. Great, thanks for answering those. Are, is that, uh, are, you, are you concluded? Any final I'm thoughts? Concluded. Great, okay, I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, a little bit of from the trenches this week. Um, got two things to talk about. One is um, there's a there was a new low code feature focus put out a couple, uh, over the last couple of weeks that talks about making a copy of a nav XP template. This is kind of in keeping with our pattern of being able to customize the existing templates that uh, come with the product. And so uh, this is a a really brief video, a three minute video. And it just shows, for example, on, on, a, on a nav XP, uh, if you're going to have an extra menu, the default is that the, that the logo is shown in it. And so I made a version of, of this that uh, just omits the logo. So it's, uh, but it shows how you can customize uh, a nav XP template starting with an existing one. So uh, that's, that's uh, the low code feature focus videos. And we'll make sure that that link is on the, chat here in a minute. And then the other thing that I wanted to cover today is the, a, a technique for automatic sign-on between separate systems. Now this is a, um, the, the use case would be that if a company has two different websites and wants users that are signed into one to be able to sign into the other without having to use separate username password. So for example, we, we might have a main.company.com and a uh, a separate website, plantanapp.company.com, and being able to, uh, if, if you're signed into the main, just to just be able to click a button and, and uh, sign into the, to the Plantanapp version. So uh, this is something that I've implemented for one of my clients, and uh, it, it uses the user management create auto login link feature. So if you're a DNN Sharp customer, that's an add-on, but if you're a Plantanapp, that's an included product. Uh, create auto login link and uh, does it through the use of an endpoint. So um, I thought I would just um, walk through that. It's a, it's a pretty brief thing, although it's going to eat into Radu's time. He's not going to have much time today. Um, 
so in, a, in my plant and app uh, application, if I go into configuration uh, and take a look at the, uh, I'm going to build it as an API endpoint. So I'm uh, going to do a new endpoint. So the idea here is that this is the, uh, and I'm, uh, this is the uh, target system, the system that I want them to, to be able to log into this plant and app. It's a, a very long name, but this plant and app application. So I'm going to provide a, a, uh, an endpoint that says, well, if I have a, a shared, if, if, I, if I sign in correctly, if I call this API correctly, and uh, it's going to return a link that's going to let me log in. Um, so the API is just simply going to, to uh, enforce whatever security that you need to do, and then uh, provide a link that lets them log in automatically. So um, my endpoint, I'm going to call it the, um, the auto automatic sign on and it's going to be a get. And um, what we're going to do, this is uh, I'm doing a little copying and pasting here, but we're going to return a link based on a shared secret. So you have to input some kind of security in place here to make sure that, um, that uh, your login is still secure, and, uh, which I'm going to ignore for the purpose of this, uh, this demonstration. It's going to be pretty insecure, but you would do some encryption. Uh, I just want to demonstrate the feature. So um, the, the input parameter that we're going to pass is uh, the secret, whatever that is. And um, then we're going to have two actions. Um, so we're going to do a create auto lo login link. Um, and the login link is going to be based on the secret. I'm actually going to pass the secret. I'm going to pass in a username into this. So the username is just going to be the secret. We'd have an extra step or two in here to, to encrypt. But in this case, the, the the uh, the end result of the secret is going to return a username, and this is going to uh, be put into the user of create auto login link. And at, at the end of this, I'm just going to redirect them when they use this link. It's going to redirect them to the home page. And just for fun, I'm going to uh, add a, a query string was auto a value of yes, and that's just going to it it could. Uh, we, we could add parameters here that are useful to the use case, but in this case, I'm just going to use it to demonstrate that, um, that it, it worked. So um, how long is this going to last? First of all, it's going to be a, a one-time login thing. And uh, the start date I'm going to use is um, the one that's recommended, which would be or mentioned in the documentation here. So it's going to be date, time, now, set. And we're going to say it's going to last for five minutes. So the link is going to be good for five minutes. And so the output is going to be uh, put in a token called login link. And now we're going, so that's, that's going to give us our link. And now we're going to uh, do a response, and it's just going to be a raw response. And the response is going to be, uh, I, I built it up fully as a link. So it's going to have the domain name and login link. It's going to be ready to go. That's the, um, that's the output. So now we can test this, and um, there's a username that exists on the system. So I'm going to pass in my secret is, uh, my my username and it gives me back a login link and um, I'm going to demonstrate now I'm going to flip to an incognito window and use it and it logs me directly into the system. So again, you'd you'd want to uh, implement that as a um, uh, you'd want to put some a, a true shared secret between them and some encryption in between them, but uh, that. Uh, is is how we would accomplish the login to happen. So in the interest of time, uh, I was going to have, uh, go to my other site and, and do the automatic sign-on. I'll just describe it briefly. It, it's just we would call this API with the, uh, with the URL that is there and uh, pass in the shared secret. 
get the answer and then redirect to that link. Uh, I'll be posting a, uh, a low-code feature focus video on this to show uh, exactly all the steps to do this. But um, that, that whole single sign-on, so, uh, uh, so long as the username exists, would allow you to go from one, one system to the other. And it could be a, doesn't have to be a plant and app or a DNN uh, system that is uh, making the call. And that's actually how I did it. I have a, a client that uses a completely different kind of CMS, but they were able to make a call, get the, get the link, and be able to sign on to this disparate system. And um, I, finishing up here, I see a question from Jim uh, about date time now offset versus date time now. And um, that's a, a really good question. And so let's take, we can uh, uh, take a look at that. Um, if we were to go, I mean, if we were to go into uh, tokens and um, use the test token feature, we can take a look at daytime now as an offset, and it returns um, this kind of a format versus uh, if we do the same thing and without the option, we see that it's a, 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 a uh, a date and time that has uh, no none of the offsets. So it's a, 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 a the precise and localized. Uh, I guess it is. It, let's see. It is server time in both cases. So um, and Radu adds O uh, blank O the letter format. It's not a zero. It is an O, and it's based on an ISO standards. Perfect. Okay, so uh, that's it for From the Trenches today, and I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Um, and Radu is going to join us. Our plan today was that uh, Radu was gonna show us uh, Search Boost as an alternative to Action Grid to display and filter data. But it turns out Radu is on an alpha version of the software and he's found some issues so, uh, and, you know, while this is a normal part of the software release process, it's unfortunate for our discussion. So he's going to cover more today uh, of why you would choose Search Boost as the display tool versus uh, using a grid. And uh, if we get into it, uh, if there's still time, we'll talk some, uh, provide some uh, useful token uh, information and techniques, but we will uh, uh, honor the topic and your time today. So Radu, if you would jump in on us. Hello. Gotcha. Hello. Okay, cool. So let me share my screen really quickly. Uh, I think this one. Um, okay. I hope you. We are seeing the website, not the yep. SQL. Got it. Okay, cool. All right. So, uh, what I did today, I I created. Uh, two independent entities and I added around exactly 20,000 entries split 10,000 with 10,000 between those two those two entities and and I, I, I would I would like to talk a little bit why why we should when we should use the grid the listing module to to see to display the data and when we should use the search uh, module, the search engine module to display the data. And the first difference between those two is that the listing module has buttons. So uh, having uh, having buttons means that you want to execute actions, you want to execute workflows, you want to work with that data, you want to, uh, to happen to want to transform it or based on that we want to you want to do something with it. While when we are talking about the search module, you just want to uh, really quickly get and see a specific record or some specific records that match your search. So in this situation, let's say, so here we have clients and there are like 10,000 clients that I, so those are, all, all of these are fake data, so don't, don't, don't worry. Uh, even though some of the emails seem, seem correct, they're all fake data. Uh, so 
the first thing that it's really cool in the listing module is the fact that you can just start really quick filtering stuff. And like, like right now, you, this is like all the mails and these are all the, in, if you click again, those are gonna be like all the, all the females and so on. Now, uh, that's cool. And you can, you know, you can, you can search like if you want to see John, uh, see so john may not be like the first name or the last name but it's the city so uh, this gives you a really uh, fast way to you know like filter your data and match a user you are saying maybe you want like john and Jaime john so maybe a combination of this uh those words is just when maybe it matched like the first name but it's also matched like the city so you are just getting to the data really quickly and now you can do some operation over that. But what happens is that maybe, maybe in, in that situation, maybe the John, the, this user right here, maybe it's also a producer and it's also a client. So we, I'm just, I'm just saying like that. So maybe we, I, if I go and search here really quickly, well, I don't find any anyone with the same name because all the data is fake. But now I here I just started finding other Johns like last name and so on. But the problem is that in 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 this particular situation, maybe I want to find information in, in all my in the, in the system as a whole it doesn't I, I don't know if it's a producer or a client or i'm not sure what it is i only have a name or i only have like a city so let's take for example i don't know vietnam let's or the country or i don't know poland I, it doesn't matter and i can use i can use the built-in search feature that plant and Amps comes with that automatically, at least until the 1.10 release, automatically indexed all all the all all the all the results that uh, uh, all, all, all the results. So you you see see now that we have like 327 clients, some way related to Poland and producers, 314 producers related to Poland. So and the cool part is that I had these results in like less than one 0 0.1 uh, in less than one second I found those those many results and this is this is this is something that happens absolutely absolutely insanely fast so if I want to right now I you know let's search for Dennis and this is like live live results uh uh and the mail I don't know so this is like Dennis and mail and I can just really quickly filter. And the cool part is that I know I have five clients and one producer, so I can just start drill drilling down in my information. And I, when I find my specific uh, entry that I want, I can uh, I can just click on it and go to, to the specific detail page of, of that user and, you know, start doing other operation and see maybe I'm searching for it, uh, his IBAN and so stuff, something like that. Um, so it's accessible from all the pages. It's right here at the top. So you can just go really quickly and search. I think the, oh, I think I must misclick when I did this and I uh, didn't put the IBAN in the search. So this is, uh, this is my mistake, but uh, uh, we can check that uh, in a moment. Now, uh, the, the idea is that the, the interesting part is that exactly as we, we already saw for the, uh, for the action grid or uh, in the Dale's video about Navixpay, how you can create new new layouts. Uh, this, the search module also supports that. And I prepared already uh, one one for you. I just gave it the same look as the, uh, as the grid that Elena did in a previous episode. And basically it's, it's the same is the same thing all the pictures and everything i did the, the uh, fancy i hope it's a fancy fancy layout and i can you know search people by name or by ip addresses so and uh, stuff like that the the main difference is that this happens insanely fast it's available all from wherever on the website that you want to access the data really quickly you can configure this information you can configure the layout and it and the, and I think this is the most interesting part, but maybe I will show you a, a proper example of this uh, in a future episode. I just want to, you know, touch really quickly, uh, show you some real, really quickly about some of the features that it has. You can either uh, 
have database indexing rules, so you can define your indexing, your rules of uh, what information you want to index. And because we support external uh, connection strings, you can connect to different uh, external databases and uh, use it, use this as your search engine. Uh, you can either uh, do some, you can uh, specify to it some sitemaps, like uh, pages, sitemaps, or SSS, SSS, RSS feeds. And uh, you can uh, index actually external uh, external sources. So imagine that you have a, like a documentation uh, website for your application or for your staff or, or something like this. And uh, you want to have one and the only search when people need help, they can just come here and you also have all, like all your databases, uh, all your uh, documentation websites, and there can be multiple of those. Uh, and the cool part is that you can actually index the pages. And I think the most important thing is that you can uh, index uh, files inside the in, inside the system. And let me show you a little bit what the file types you can actually, uh, you can index. I think the most important are the PDF files and the Word documents. Also, if you if you are like more data-driven and you have Excel documents, also we, we can have a look uh, uh, into into those, so yeah, th that's that's the that's the power of the search engine, and this is not something that the grid the the listing module can do. Uh, it's more like it's it's very good. The listing module is very good, you know, to show like all your entries, but it's not very good on uh, on searching like uh, documents or text, big texts, uh, because what's happening is each time that you you are searching in the in the listing module. At that point, you are running a query against the database each time, and over and over again. And maybe it seems fast right now for me because you know my my, my at least my data is not that complex, and I'm using the default data source, and I'm the only user logged in at the moment in the, into into this system. But if you know people start searching and searching and you start having more and more data into the system you, you might see like well this is not fast enough for me anymore uh and i have like traffic and stuff like that well the secret is that the search engine module what it does it's based on the lucene index like google was a few years ago and it's actually creating uh indexes on the disk and it's not accessing and forcing the database to do any work when people are actually searching for that information and because it's looking at the disk and it has the file structure in such way it, it can provide the results really quick and you, you saw like less than you know 0.1 second and stuff stuff like that so that's pretty amazing and having the power to connect multiple sources in multiple direction i think that's um that's in documents that's that's actually the the cool the cool part so so finding the right tool for the right uh for the right job yes and let me let me and i actually can give you a, a, a functional example I, I i mean like our our blog on the on the plant and app website our blog is done in such manner so i i, I had the option uh when when the guys asked me to you know build a, a small blog here, I had the option to act, either use Action Grid or use the search with the engine, and uh, the search the you know the search engine, and uh, I give it like a, a few minutes of thinking, and I I just thought well, uh, what are my advantages and disadvantages? And the, the first thing was I don't for a blog module, building it like like not not a blog module but like a, a, a blog itself. Uh, on the website, do I need buttons? Do I need actions? Do I need workflows? Or what do I actually need? And the result was, well, people that come here want to read content and for reading content, they want to search for content and that's it. The, the result at the end is going to be one link or one, you know, card like this that they're going to click. So nothing else. So wh why should I use the, uh, the action grid, which comes with the whole button logic, the angular, the angular front end, and it has to render everything. It has filters that I'm not going to use. And, you know, a lot of stuff, a lot of things that, you know, the module itself is comprehensive, but I, I want it to be fast and I want it to be user friendly. So I, and I, I just didn't need that sure. much power. So the use case is all about getting them to the right piece of information. Yes. And sometimes, and look what happens in some situation, you are, maybe you're using the entities and if you're using the entities, well, that's great because 
we we are doing indexes and uh, you know we are taking care of your of your table so we ensure like everything uh, that comes in the listing module is, is properly formatted but if you start having like you know a lot of bunch of text uh, at the, at some point you may not uh, be able to do indexes uh, on on those columns so we have to enable the full full text index I think that that's how it was called and you start your you know you start having a lot of manual work to do and you have to maintain those indexes and you're start getting into another stuff into a whole other uh, other stuff uh, maintaining uh, a proper functional and very fast grid because the behind the scenes it's very crowded let's say mm -hmm. but with search boost you don't need to, it's, it's gonna handle everything you just pass the data once you specify well i want this data to be fast and deliver very quickly and i want you know you can have like books inside behind the scenes in the in the database where, where whatever you're putting it's gonna go fast as very 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 fast so you see we have like the busted here i can just go busted really quickly and it's just gonna pop up this this result also if i need to filter uh oh well I need to go again because it's not resetting. But I, if I want to see only the ideas, I well, I can just really click really here really quickly, and I have like ideas, and I can clear the filters, uh, and 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 stuff like that. We have a we have a question from Jim who wants to know if is there only one search per site, or can you have separate searches to, depending on? You know. uh, yeah, sure. Let me give you the best answer for this. Uh, you can have as many searches as you want. Uh, we call them uh, behaviors. Uh, here at the top, you can manage and have as many as you want and each individual behavior will have each individual settings. And how it works, you usually have, uh, the, so the search boost itself comes with two modules that you can drag on the pages. It has a search input and a search output. So usually you put an input and an output. And when you search, uh, you define basically in the, the input itself, you just go and uh, Point select it to a the, behavior. Sorry? Point it to a behavior. Yeah, exactly. Point it to a behavior. And in the behavior, you can see. So if I search in this input text box, I'm going to, uh, in this, you know, this behavior is going to be responsible of this. Uh, this um, input. This is a skin object, but let me let me show. You. I have a, a custom a, another one that I did. Maybe that makes more more sense. So I have like a custom search. The, the custom search is the module, and it has the module ID, and it's set up on a specific page. So whenever uh, someone searches in that search box, I'm gonna be um, uh, redirecting it to this specific page as a result and I'm going to use this template and so on and each individual behavior can be uh, combined with each individual uh, uh, search box so, and search outputs. So you can define different searches and um, uh, from a from a end user perspective that they, they're searching in a product area or a customer area, and it would focus, the, the results would all be focused on, on that topic. A little bit of management to do behind the scenes to get it set up right. Yeah, yeah, and um, if, if you're gonna use the built-in entities, don't worry, it's gonna apply the security properly as you define them in the, in the entity. So if I go, for the example, for my customer or client, whatever, uh whatever permission of reading those stuff you and the roles that you have in the system well that's the results that they're going to be able to get so if the user don't a user doesn't have their the permission to read even though if, if it's going to come and search something on the site because it's not able to receive that entry it's not going to get the result because it doesn't have permission to see it in a, so why why should be able to search for it right right so um, another thought, um, you can use razor templates for this as well, right? Uh, yes. Um, so there are, let me give you a quick example. So there are, there are two ways to customize. So the easiest way to customize something like this, and uh, I'm going to go back to my custom search really quickly here. Uh, I have a database indexing rule. 
and let's let's have a look a little bit how how it, it looks behind the scenes so i just give it a name uh, and maybe in a future episode i can explain a little bit what the boost is uh, so i'm just gonna i'm just i just defined an input query and i click load load columns and then all the columns that the query brought i have them here and it's ask is and it's asking me which are uh, which information are we interested in indexing so i clicked some of them uh, mainly the one that i was interested in and then uh, it asked me, hey, well, okay, we have results, but we, the result has a source. So how do I redirect to that source? I specified that uh, because I was just bringing the clients up, I want the detail page of the clients in the same website to be the result. I left the role uh, permissions to be to to be inherited, and usually in this situation means that th those are public. Uh, I selected the ID column, the title column, and here's like the first piece of like my uh, customization. So this is like the description. And in the description, I, I could write uh, small pieces of HTML and I'm using the tokens and the tokens mean that you can use all, any token that you specify here in the indexing part. Yep. And just going a little bit below, uh, I want to pass the ID the ID as the client, uh, client ID query string. So if I go really quickly here and search for uh, John, uh, I will, uh, come on. I will have like the client ID attached to the default link and uh, redirected and so on. Uh, but yeah, th this is like the small, a small customization part too. I think uh, Dale, what you're referring to uh, is uh, if I can create output templates or input templates uh, that look different. So you, you saw earlier that I had the, those cards that were flipping. Right. So yeah, you can do that. And let me bring up my remote one, give me one second. So uh, you can go in uh, into desktop modules, uh, DNS sharp, uh, search boost templates, and you either have input and output. So it's the search bar or the results. Uh, for my example, I, I had output and I have my custom template right here. Usually how you can do it, and this is this is actually incredible, simple, very simple. You just choose what from the default or the pop output, the default usually or the pop output. You just, um, I did, I think I did the pop output uh, the, here. Uh, I just copy and paste it here. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna... Makes Maybe a few really. modifications that similar to the templates that we've been doing in past episodes. Yep, custom, uh, custom two, and it's actually really, really simple. You go the f the first thing that you need to do is go into the template just just and config, and uh, just you know give it give it a, a new name. I'm gonna name it you know custom two doesn't matter, and the display name I'm gonna name it you know custom two as well. And you can just save this, and you basic you're basically done. Uh, you, if I refresh really quickly the uh, the search, you, you we should be able to see a new a new template. It's identical with the default one. Uh, let's see, output template really clear, and we should uh, maybe uh, I should clear the sure. yeah I should clear the cache. I think this those informations are cached, but it should pop here and. Uh, after that, you just go into the templates, uh, CS HTML, and uh, if you edit it really quickly, you will see um, there's a there's a, some, some this is writer code, so you're gonna have some a big you know C sharp part, but you can identify the HTML part and how it looks and how it's done, and you just need to you know touch. You, you can modify it as as you want. I hopefully. It's if you're not actually you know programming this maybe you it seems may seem a little bit hard at the first time but you can see like those are the icons and if you want for example if it's a, the extension of a document index is doc we put the external the document extension as a picture and maybe you want some other uh, pictures based on your documents maybe you're using with Photoshop or something like that and you want to store the data so you can just come and add a new case here. Uh, maybe I can show you exactly. So this is everything it like has comments. Like this is the title part. This is the link part. This is the author part. This is the but, publish and so on. But like the templates that we've done before, if you make a copy of an existing one and make modifications, it's safe to try. 
it's safe to, uh, it'll be upgrade safe when you get one that works and you can, you can uh, delete it and start over if you uh, completely make a mistake of it. So um, it, it follows the same development pattern that we've seen in past episodes. Well, good. We've we've made it to uh, to uh, to our there it is C two. We've made it to our hour, so I don't want to to uh, it's probably find a good place to stop here. Cool. Good. If you'll unshare and maybe Bogdan can close us out. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Radu. Thanks, Dave, for showing uh, showing us this technique. Uh, I think it's a very, very powerful technique that's very underutilized by uh, by our customers, uh, especially for building this kind of visualizations for multiple entries of data and make it really, really fast. You know, when uh, I think the the bottom line is if you need flexibility, if you need power, like buttons, actions, and action grid is the options to go. If you need just visualization. Search boost is the option to go. Cool. So uh, hopefully you got a lot of uh, good content, good ideas today, and uh, uh, good uh, uh, inspiration to try for for your next uh, challenges. Thanks for being here, and we'll be seeing you again next week. Have a wonderful day slash evening, everyone.